Why are we continuing to play this little game when we all know it is moved to the next stage? You're listening to Banal of America Audio. I'm the last living member of the Dharma Initiative. What's happened really since the 98 explosion? Would you say that the Mars anomaly communities uh, petered out or the wells kind of running dry or just sort of uh, ebbs and flows with uh, whatever is going on with the mainstream sciences work well, on Mars? Well, it continued to grow after 1998 because more and more images were taken. And yeah. It became almost kind of like this... Uh, celebratory atmosphere. Let's go. You know, more images, all right. You know, let's let's spend the next few months just you know going over them with a fine tooth comb, and that was kind of exciting and fun, and that was that was uh, part of the uh, raison d'être of the of the Sidonian imperative. It was fun to get these images and take a close look, and you know, ask you know, what are we seeing here? Is it could this possibly be artificial, or are we looking at weird geology, mm-hmm. or some combination of both? And uh, that continued for a while, and I think I think now we've reached the point where it's kind of just going with the flow. Um, the Mars Global Severe spacecraft just recently went offline. Uh, it's not it's not returning images anymore. However, we have an even better spacecraft in orbit, uh, equipped to take images, to take pictures of the surface, and uh, it's called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, yeah. and it has near spy camera resolution. It's oh, got wow. like 15, uh, 15 meters per excuse me, fifteen centimeters per pixel. Oh wow! Which is really good. Yeah, we can look at the individual boulders with this thing, and we already have. It's 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 already distinguished the Pathfinder mission ensemble on the surface and you know those those weren't big vehicles by any means those are those rather small so uh, yeah we have a we have a platform in orbit right now that could really help us resolve some important questions at the heart of the debate um, and hopefully that will hopefully that will have a revitalizing effect on the the scientific aspect of, of the online of the online anomaly movement, and kind of drag it out of the uh, political mire. Uh, nevertheless, I don't think politics are going to be going away anytime soon. Because as long as we have to, as long as we have to deal with the JPL as the as the mediator between these images and the public, it's going to present a problem because they are they are openly hostile to the possibilities that Mars might have uh, uh, not not only. Um, life, but let alone, you know, <laughs> giant megalithic architecture. So this is going to be kind of a problem, and it's going to be pretty interesting, I think. And it's possibly going to breathe some more life into it. And I'm still waiting uh, for uh, images that might confirm some of the some of the some of the more subtle artificial-looking features noted in the last volley of of Mars Global Surveyor photos, such as. Uh, um, an eye on the face. There's a very, there's a very obvious uh, looking eye on one half of the face on Mars that looks very humanoid. Yes, yeah. it's, it's almond shaped. It has a nice little elliptical basin and a and a pupil like structure in the middle. And uh, and this wasn't even visible in the old Viking photos. So the the odds of having a secondary feature confirm. Um, the impression of a of a of an anthropomorphic likeness on the Martian surface is is highly unlikely if this is a natural formation. So I'm very interested in that, among other features. One aspect that you talk about in the book uh, on the Mars anomaly community, and it's a sort of a sub, even more of a sub aspect of of, of Mars anomaly, and that's these uh, sort of Martian Nazca lines, if you will. Um, you know what I'm talking about here? Mm, yeah. Can you yeah. talk a little bit because uh, they don't get much press. Uh, in many cases, they don't deserve very much press because they're pretty, uh, they're pretty ink blot. You know, yeah. they kind of fall into that category. But again, they present an interesting epistemological challenge to uh, debunkers because we have. And I'm talking about like profile features. Like there's one called Nefertiti, which looks a lot like Nefertiti, yeah. except it's seen in profile. You know, and uh, and there are lots of those like that. that people people see these. Um, um, Profile visages of human faces and other and other objects, animals, and, and and so forth, on Mars, and and most of the time these are very very selective, and they don't impress me at all. But nevertheless, they kind of present an interesting challenge to how we how we know what we know, and that's kind of where my where my interest lies regarding these, uh, because we have features on Earth that built by built by uh, like the Peruvians with the Nazca lines and uh, uh, other Indian cultures in, in North America. Uh, that were built in profile and uh, to resemble actual likenesses, yeah. animal likenesses, and so forth. And, and they look, and they look, you know, like kind of abstract. But nevertheless, they are artificial. Mm-hmm. 
So if you see a profile that looks something like a human face on Mars, it's much easier to it's much easier to get a profile than a frontal than a frontal view. Like the old man of the mountain is cited as an example by debunkers. Yeah. And uh, and there are other there are other examples all over the world. So uh, there's less information involved with features like this that uh, and and that enables the imagination to kind of fill in the blanks. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily preclude the possibility that they might be real. So perhaps we shouldn't discount them immediately. At the very least, maybe we should kind of study the, the, the mechanics of perception involved when we're looking at these things and, and apply that and deal with it usefully instead of using it as just instant fodder for debunking arguments, which are already pretty, pretty lame anyway. Because yeah. the fact is that we're dealing with an alien species on Mars, then, then who knows what they were up to, and and for that matter, who knows what technological level they they were they were at. We don't know. We don't know if you're dealing with a high tech civilization, some sort of some sort of planet hopping civilization uh, that passed through our solar system long ago, or a civilization that evolved on Mars and had the the technological abilities of, associated with like a Bronze Age or Egyptian yeah. culture. We really we, there are lots of unanswered questions, and I think some of our stubborn refusal to deal with with uh, the Martian thing was kind of stems from our own our own grudging ignorance of of of, of when Mars was able to support life, how little we know about the planet itself, you know, to say nothing of, of, of the role of intelligence. All right, now I should probably ask you about uh, the sort of 400-pound gorilla in the room on, on when you're discussing Mars and the face and all that good stuff, and you know where I'm going to say now. I think so. And that's uh, that's Richard C. Hoagland. He's, he's uh, sort of the black hole of uh, Martian face research. 400 pounds. I, I, it's just more like at least 1,000 pounds. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, well, yeah, you know, well, if I don't mention him, then, then you know, we're kind of skirting the issue. So let's talk about Richard C. Hoagland uh, as much as you want to say without trying to get me sued or anything. <laughs> um, no, Richard. Richard Hoagland, is, I, I, The Monuments of Mars is, is a wonderful book. It's a wonderful speculative book, and it's, it's quite informative. And it's, it has lots of, it incorporates lots of early, early research and lots of uh, interesting anecdotes about some of the people originally involved with the inquiry. And uh, I, I think really very highly of Richard, some of Richard Hoagland's work. I don't think very highly of some other of, of Richard Hoagland's work. Yeah. His more recent output to me uh, is, is not very impressive. And uh, it seems to me that the combination of the of discovering the internet and kind of I was referred to the kind of waiting interim period between the between the 1976 images and the and the new uh, Mars Global Surveyor images. Uh, I think that kind of that kind of cabin fever while waiting for some new inputs from some new data from Mars. Yeah. Uh, didn't really bode well for his 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 uh, sense of scientific caution. Uh, we've got lots of lots of rather elaborate uh, numerical uh, analyses of the Martian surface that are you know the numbers don't don't work because we don't have we don't have resolution that that accommodates that kind of tolerance. Yeah, he's he's referring to features like uh, relating features to each other to a degree of accuracy that we're simply unable to do with with even some of the images we have now with, with yeah. the good with the good probes. Uh, let alone the Viking images, and uh, I think he had already kind of cemented his own position on what these what these features entailed, and went about kind of forcing a lot of these a lot of these discoveries into uh, into what he already knew subjectively was the case. And he's an immensely popular figure. He's on late night radio all the time. Yeah. He's uh, he's entertaining. He's articulate. He seems like a, a pretty nice guy, and. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I agree, agree with with what he's saying, and he seems to fulfill the role of an entertainer more than he does as a scientific uh, personality. I mean, I think he, he presents himself as kind of like the Carl Sagan of Cydonia, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. I'm not exactly sold on that. I mean, when I use the inter term entertainer, I use it pretty. I mean that in a good sense. I'm mm -hmm. being kind of you know charitable. I'm not trying to be condescending. And I think he's well aware that he's that he's an entertaining figure and kind of goes for that. But uh, I'm just I'm just very skeptical of of, of Hoagland and uh, don't think as highly of his of his later work uh, as I do as, of his earlier work. And you know that's that's basically the extent of it. It's nothing personal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just 
you know, I just just don't think his his new stuff is as good as his old stuff. There you go. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to ask. That's how that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, just touching on this anomaly community uh, in and of itself. Um, as you said, it's sort of tightly knit, and you didn't want to get uh, pigeonholed into it. Um, but what was the reaction of the community when you started putting your work out there? Because uh, there's a lot of talk uh, when I talk about ufology with people about how there's sort of um, that it's sort of a closed society, and you sort of got to work your way in and everything. And um, I assume it was sort of the same way with you in the Mars Anomaly community. So uh, maybe just talk about your integration into that community and, and what that was like. Yeah, initially there was some a combination of resentment, and uh, some people really, really liked where he's coming from. It's like, okay, this guy, you know, he's he's not claiming all the all the answers, and this was very refreshing to lots yeah. of readers. To, to, to be able to look at some images and, and think about them without being told what they're seeing, you know, and uh, and the and told all about the attending NASA cover-ups and everything. Yeah. So there was there was some uh, some appreciation there, but there was also some resentment, like you know, well, hey, Hoagland's the, you know, he's the expert here. Who's this guy? You know, what's yeah. Well, who cares what well, you have to say? You're, you know, you're a, you're a Hoagland wannabe. You know that that was leveled at me by a few people oh, wow. associated with Hoagland, and uh, it's, it's it's silly because it's obviously that I'm not trying to be anything like Hoagland. But uh, but yeah, it was a mixed reaction. Overall, it was positive, and uh, and it, uh, the the fact that I was able to get a you know write a book kind of summarizing my my basic position on this, on this whole inquiry was was very uh, gratifying. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, yeah, it sounds like uh, that the Mars Anomaly community has the same amount of turf wars that you expect. Uh, from oh, yeah, it's nothing but turf wars. It's it's every bit as ugly as the UFO community. But but yeah, you're right. It's very insulated. It's very uh, often its own little own little uh, convention hall, and uh, what goes on there is is isn't really noted by anyone else. Yeah. And to a degree, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, the very fact that you're you're hermetically sealing yourself in this little fan-like community uh, <laughs> is unhealthy for uh, other other elements of the spectrum. And you know, I just I just am unable to see these things in isolated boxes. Yeah. I I can't help but feel that there is a, a thread of commonality through all this. And uh, Mars is just a component of a much larger mystery. Yeah. And another fascinating aspect uh, that you talk about is, and this I really enjoyed because I really do like uh, people, on, and you definitely seem to do this with not just this work but the, uh, your later work that we're going to talk about, is that you take a really nice big picture perspective on these things. It's nice that you pull back from the from the uh, from the low level sort of arguments and take a really good big picture look at things. And one aspect of that that I noticed in uh, after the Martian apocalypse was face on Mars as meme. Because mm -hmm. um, that's just fascinating. Let's talk about that. No, I, the face on Mars is an, you know, an ideological product. Yeah. And it, I, I compare it to the alien face meme. Uh, the, we, all, we all know, for example, now what, what, what aliens look like. They're big and uh, big heads. Big bald heads with big insect-like eyes and little spindly, uh, spindly necks and, and slit mouths and nostrils, and that's thanks in large part to uh, not not entirely, but the, it really achieved a lot of momentum with the publication of Whitley Strieber's Communion yeah. in 1987. That image really resonated with a lot of people in a very interesting way, and. Uh, and then you had it minimalized even further by there was a cartoonist. Well, there still is. I don't know what he's doing right now. Bill Barker, who had this wonderful uh, comic strip called uh, "Very Paranoid." It's kind of like a if, if Franz Kafka did a, did a single panel comic strip, it would look a lot like this. <laughs> and it was called Schwa. And at one time, it had a really good online presence. And I haven't. It's kind of it's it's laid low. Yeah. And I, it's hard to find right now. But anyway, it uh, he he kind of made it this very iconic alien emblem with the big eyes, you know. And he deleted the mouth, deleted the nose, and it just became the symbol, you know. And it just uh, was a very portentous symbol. I mean, you saw it, and you knew what it meant. Oh, we're dealing with aliens. We're dealing with weird stuff. And uh, he just kind of made it iconic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the face on Mars is kind of. Uh, in the same realm as that ubiquitous alien head. It's a consumer archetype now, and uh, it's kind of emblematic of, of the unknown in a very in a very uh, specific sense. Yeah. Of you know, it kind of touches the touches the uh, uh, the viewer's mind in in, in a way that uh, nothing else really can. It's part of a visual vocabulary that's sprung up, 
And uh, the whole idea of the meme as an infectious idea is kind of relatively new science. And uh, it's it's it deals with the spread of information in a viral in a viral manner. Yeah. And the internet has totally has totally given this thing um, its own Workshop. playing field yeah. in a way that even the print in the print media didn't have before that. We're able to see ideas traverse the globe in, in you know microseconds and spring up in weird new ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're seeing it almost a form of artificial life. And, uh, you know, ideas don't necessarily fare well because they're accurate, although that sometimes helps, um, but simply because people enjoy having them. People enjoy experiencing or savoring an idea, mm -hmm. no matter how unwieldy or inaccurate it might be or how fragile it might prove to be. And uh, so, yeah, in, in one chapter and after the Martian apocalypse, I just kind of stand back and look at this whole uh, ideological landscape associated with the face on Mars and uh, and aliens, in quotes, yeah, and and UFOs and and leaked documents and and uh, NASA cover-ups and all this stuff, and it becomes almost irrelevant if it's if it's fact or fiction at at a certain point, and it just becomes this. Uh, just this, just this rippling, uh, seething mass of information. This is very interesting to take in from from an aesthetic point of view, almost. And uh, so, yeah, that's an aspect of this whole Fortean uh, scene that eludes some people. I think not everyone by any means, but uh, you know, most people are, are are still committed to this. I believe this, or or I don't believe this. I I think it's all I think it's all crap, and uh, I think that I think that's an unproductive way of dealing with this new this new ecology of information that's been emerging and continues to grow every day. Almost as if whether it's right or wrong isn't really as important as the fact that it exists in and of itself. Exactly. It's a very it's very postmodern and very uh, and very uh, kind of kind of conceptual. You know, it's kind yeah. of like looking at concept art or something. Yeah. But it's but it's it's educational. You can learn from it. You can you can you can if you're willing to stand back and look at this thing from a healthy clinical distance and just appreciate it for the sheer absurdity of it. Yeah. It's actually it's actually quite a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think a lot of that uh, about the UFO phenomenon itself. And that. Oh yeah. Totally. Yeah. The all the politics and all the all the all the claims and counterclaims and, uh, you know, at what point do you, you know, at some point you just kind of stop caring what's real on a certain level, not, mm -hmm. not, not yeah, your main I level. I know exactly but, what you mean. Right. You just kind of take it all in and, and almost, almost on a subconscious level you appreciate what's going on, the ebb and flow of it. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you uh, do you tackle moon artifacts at all? Have you ever touched that realm of uh, that's that's you know sort of a, a sh offshoot of the Martian artifacts? Mm -hmm. There are weird. There are some weird features on the moon. I'm not an expert on them, uh, but there are enough strange features on the moon and, and repeated observations of lunar transient phenomena, for example, that that make me think that there could very well be some interesting um, features. That, waiting to be discovered on the lunar surface. And that's neat because the moon is only three days away, yeah. whereas Mars is, you know, the better part of the year. And uh, it's very, it's a lot easier, obviously, to get to the moon than Mars. So if there is something waiting for us on the on the moon, whether it be some sort of a monolith or something, or something much more, you know, trivial, in, you know, in, in an inter in, a, in an extraterrestrial context, you know, ruins of some sort. That's going to tell us a lot about who we think we are. And uh, so I'm hopeful that it, that, a, that a future moon probe or maybe even something we have up there up there now will, will you know, show us evidence of this and that we'll get it in a forthright manner and we'll be able to, it'll hasten our breaking out of this, of this shop-worn skeptic believer dichotomy, which, you know, I... Don't have any patience for it. Yeah, and then uh, sort of to close out this this Mars discussion, uh, where do you see the Mars work going from NASA? And you sort of alluded that you don't think we're going to really get to the bottom of the space Sidonia anomaly situation until we have men on Mars or archaeological work being done there. Uh, so where do you see this Mars work going from NASA in the future? I can't help but feel that there must be some interest somewhere within the NASA chain of command you know someone somewhere is going to is going to uh, propose you know let's take a look at this at this feature you know let's go take a little a dig and take some ultrasound readings and see if there might be you know something to this yeah uh, that's assuming of course that we make it to Mars and uh, right now it looks like that's in the in the in the uh, 
in the itinerary. It looks like we will be going to Mars eventually, and I certainly hope so. Uh, probably can't get there fast enough for my for my own, for my own <laughs> point of view. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I think we're going to be going back to Mars and back to the Moon rather, and then on to Mars from there. And from then, it's probably only a matter of time until we have uh, the answer one way or another. Once yeah. we establish a presence on the planet and start sending uh, crews out to explore and uh, take take specimens and and uh, you know flirt around with the idea of terraforming the planet and stuff like that, it, eventually we're going to either stumble across something or we're going to make a directed attempt to uh, discern whether something once thought to be artificial is or is or isn't. So it's it's probably an unstoppable process at this point. Yeah. Uh, what's what it, what remains a variable is whether or not this is made uh, general is, is made public is made uh, is, is made uh, accessible to the to the masses and uh, you know that's when all the that's where all the cover up theories come in, obviously. Now, do you think if if it turned out that the face was real, like uh, in in the sense that it was an artificial structure? that the government would let uh, the people know, or what, what's your take on that whole thing? Well, it would depend on what the face represents. If it represents a Bronze Age technology or something, in other words, something not that, not in advance of our own technology, yeah. oh yeah, maybe so. Uh, if if it's built by someone that was more advanced than we are, then we might see more of a, more of a paranoid mentality uh, arise, because, uh, because, because digging into it would entail uh, Possibly, you know, giving people information that we can't, quote unquote, can't handle, you know, yeah, yeah. At, our, at our stage of development. But, you know, and that's and that's an assumption made by lots of people that that the face is invariably made by, you know, extrasolar aliens that are that are godlike. And uh, from looking at the from looking at the features on Mars, my impression is that the, whoever made these things, assuming hypothetically that they were indeed made, mm -hmm. weren't godlike. They weren't. They weren't. Um, Infallible aliens. They were. Uh, they had. They had very, uh, very limited uh, resources, and uh, that invites the notion that they might have been human in, in, in some way that we're not. That we don't really know. That our. That our. Uh, that our. That our textbooks don't really give any. Uh, don't offer any <laughs> recourse. Yeah. In other words, we're kind of venturing into some uncharted waters with this. Mm -hmm. The, the stuff on Mars as far as Sidonia, that, that looks more like uh, something you'd see in ancient Egypt. Then. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, yeah, and it, it's been noted before. You know, some people even go so far as to say, well, the ancient Egyptians must must have invented space flight and flown to Mars and built this stuff, and I don't think that for a minute. But, <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, there's this eerie, uh, uh, the fact that we're able to look at this stuff and and, and associ associate with it and, and make sense of it on, a, on an aesthetic level. You know, the fact that the face is humanoid for crying out loud, that's, that's not what we would necessarily expect from uh, visitors from some other solar system. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it implies a terrestrial connection of some kind, and I think that's been, I think that's been the, uh, the kiss of death for many researchers who are trying to prove this terrestrial connection and come up with some really ludicrous ideas. Uh, then again, who's to say what's ludicrous and what's not? It's a, you know, there are no maps for these territories. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking it would be a refreshing day when uh, they do land in Sidonia and get some answers. Uh, I hope, hopefully, we'll be around when that happens. So I think we will be. Yeah, and it's, gonna, it's going to be refreshing for me whether the face is is is, is rock or whether it's uh, an artifact. Yeah. I just it, I just want an answer. You know, I don't want to believe anything in particular, and some people refuse to to take me at face value when I say that. But uh, I really don't care. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's it just in and of itself, it'll be fascinating, and 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 uh, I think uh, the reaction will be possibly even more fascinating. Yeah, so. I mean, Mar Mars is has no shortage of, of of discoveries in store for us. You know, we don't need uh, the face of Mars. Some people have argued about UFOs and stuff. It's like, you know, why can't people just be interested and, and fascinated by the universe on its own terms? You know, why do we need to populate populate it with UFOs and stuff? Well, these people are, are in, ignorant in the sense that they they're not aware that the UFO phenomenon, for example. Is is quite real, and seems to represent something physical and unknown. Um, but uh, the point they have is valid. Uh, the universe is is rather strange, and, we, and if if UFOs and the face on Mars and other enigmas like this didn't exist, uh, for me personally, there wouldn't be any real psychological advantage to inventing them. That does it for this week's edition of Banal of America Audio. Big thanks to Mac Tonys for coming on the show. He'll be back next week for part two of two. 
If you want to find out more about Mac Tony's, his blog is posthumanblues.blogspot.com, posthumanblues.blogspot.com, and his formal website is mactonies.com, M-A-C-T-O-N-N-I-E-S.com. Moving right along now, it's time for Been All of America Audio listener feedback, and this week's letter comes from a person billed only as Towner. Here's what Towner has to say. While interviewing your guests, you keep saying, yeah, 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 over and over. It drives me crazy. Why not just let the speaker get their point across in silence? This would make for a much better show. Stop the yeah, yeah, yeah after every sentence. Signed, Towner. Thank you very much for the feedback, Towner. I appreciate the constructive criticism. I have noticed over the course of the last season and a half that I have picked up some hosting foibles, some strange catchphrases, if you will, and definitely the yeah, yeah, yeah is one of them. When we tape the next batch of interviews, I will make it a point to refrain from using the yeah, 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 and hopefully it will be noticeable to those of you in the audience who have noticed it and find it cringeworthy. Thank you again for writing in, Towner. Stick with us, and hopefully you'll enjoy listening to the evolution of BOA Audio. If you would like to be a part of Been All of America Audio listener feedback, simply go to binallofamerica.com, click the contact button in the top right-hand corner of the screen. That will put you on the page with the appropriate contact information. Or write to boaaudio at hotmail.com. Either one of those methods will put your correspondence on the road to being featured on Been All of America Audio listener feedback. Up next, it's time to thank the great binallofamerica.com staff. Leslie, Chiron, Arlie, Joe V, Ralph Molesworth, and Tina Senna, thank you so much for your help and support with the audio series and the website. If you're only listening to BOA Audio and you're not reading the fantastic columns from the BOA staff, you're only getting half the story. Compelling, esoteric reading material produced week in and week out from the fine folks at BenAllOfAmerica.com. Definitely check out their columns. You will not be disappointed. BenAllOfAmerica.com, make it a part of your everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. If you're a long-time Benall of America audio listener or an appreciative newcomer and you want to help support the audio series and the website, simply click the PayPal button at BenAllOfAmerica.com and make a donation. Every donation helps, no donation is too small, and all donations go towards keeping BOA audio on the air and available to our many listeners worldwide. Next week on the program, part two of two with Mac Tony's Crypto Terrestrial Hypothesis and Esoterica in general. It is going to be almost double the length of this week's installment. It broke down in a strange sort of way. An hour on Mars, an hour on the Crypto Terrestrial Hypothesis, and an hour on the world of Esoterica in general. Instead of splitting that Crypto Terrestrial hour in half, I opted to run two hours next week and one hour this week, so next week's will be an expanded edition with Mac Tony's. For starters, the Crypto Terrestrial Hypothesis has taken the esoteric world by storm and has been a major talking point throughout the last year at least. We're going to talk about how it all started, how Mac came up with this whole thing, and what the Crypto Terrestrial Hypothesis is. If you've only vaguely heard about it but haven't really investigated it, Now's your chance next week on BOA Audio, because we're going to dig into the Crypto Terrestrial Hypothesis and cover it from a plethora of different angles. After that, we're going to talk about Esoterica in general, focusing really on ufology, youth and ufology, ufology on the internet, disclosure, and just tons and tons of other stuff. We really cover a wide variety of stuff in the last hour of the interview, so it's a jam-packed edition of BOA Audio next week with Mac Tony's Part 2 of 2, preview forthcoming at BOA. And on that note, we're going to call it a week. Thank you very much for listening, folks. Until you hear from me next week, this is Tim Benall, signing off.